Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here, even though I am fighting against the jet lag. There is none hour difference between here and Seattle, so big with me. <laughs> I'm going to try to not sleep on stage. Um, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to present Babylon GS. Uh, it's an engine I created six years ago, um, and uh, it's an engine that I am pretty proud of because now it's, very, it's used um, in a lot of important places. For instance, that's PowerPoint. But this little guy here is a 3D object animated by Babylon GS inside PowerPoint. Uh, and actually, at Microsoft, every time you're going to see 3D, it's probably a 99% sure that it's actually based on Babylon GS. And Babylon GS, it's something that I'm going to present right now. It's an open source framework. It's entirely free. It's based on Apache 2, or uh, do the heck you want with the, uh, the code. Um, there is no license, no nothing. It's um, brand new at Microsoft. We are using our own technology here, but this technology is entirely free for you to use um, in any place you want. It's based on any, uh, in a lot of um, web open standards and web open frameworks like WebGL 1 and 2, WebGPU. So WebGPU, um, are you aware of what WebGPU is? Who knows? Okay, quite a few. Uh, it's the evolution of WebGL, actually. It's um, Metal slash Vulkan slash DirectX 12 for the web. Uh, it's a new technology that we are working on with uh, Apple and uh, Google to support. The interesting uh, point here of using Babylon GS is that if you want to use 3D today, you do, not have, you do not have to worry about that. We will take care for you of all the underlying frameworks like WebGL 1, 2, or WebGPU. We also support WebXR. I'm going to do a quick demo later. It's a full-fledged uh, game engine and uh, rendering engine. So we support physics, animation, VR, particle, ray casting. I don't like this image, but that's the best I can have. Um, it's kind of the unity for the web, if I may. We're going to provide you tools to create uh, 3D on the web without the burden of understanding shaders and math and stuff like that. We also support physically based rendering. It's an advanced technique created by Disney, uh, starting with, I don't know, Untangle, the name of the movie. I am not sure it's the right translation anyway. The lady with the long hairs. They created PBR for this um, uh, cartoon. And this PBR, and thanks to the power of our computer now, can be now rendered in real time on the web. I'm going to get back to that later as well. We have principles, and I'm, I'm very glad to uh, have my talk after John's one, because we have exactly the same principle. Like bug first, uh, we create tools before the engine and stuff like that. And we are also backward compatible. That's something that just pissed me off a lot when I have to update to a new version of a framework, and I have to rewrite everything. That's something I do not want for Babylon GS users. So if you are using Babylon GS, you will be able to run it up until the next version without having to change anything on your code. We do not break backward compatibility. And we are also supporting GLTF. Who is aware of what GLTF is? OK. <laughs> so GLTF stands for Graphic Library Transport Format, and that's the JPEG of 3D. Uh, you think about JPEG, if I give you a JPEG image, you will be able to display it on your computer, right? Because everyone understands JPEG or PNG. For 3D objects, like the file format itself, it was a mess up until now, because there were like 10,000 million different file formats, all incompatible, obviously, and all proprietary. So we sit down with the Kronos group, the group who is standardizing WebGL, and we define to all together, and by all I mean Google, Facebook, Microsoft, NVIDIA, et cetera, et cetera. We define a file format, and this file format is GLTF here. So if you want to render a 3D object, like the dinosaur I was rendering before, it's a GLTF file format. And so by supporting this file format, we ensure that your, file for your object will be displayed and compatible. It's an open source project since the very beginning. It was started as an open source project. It's still an open source project. Uh, we have uh, around like 100,000 posts on the forum. It's a very active forum. Most of the users, when they come to us, the number one reason they come to use Babylon GS is because of the forum. We have a very lovely community. It's very helpful. You, there is uh, no, uh, no shame. It's definitely a place where you can ask any question and you will get a response in a matter of a few days. We also have a pretty, uh, big, uh, a pretty large number of active supporters, like people contributing to the forum and to the engine itself. So it's used 
in a very... Uh, it's funny because I started it six years ago and I was the only developer <laughs> and it was only for me. Uh, and now it's used uh, across the web. Adobe is using, Adobe is using it for their product. Uh, Bing, Microsoft apps, obviously, I mentioned SharePoint, PowerPoint, etc. But it's also used by Dolby, by Minecraft. If you go to Minecraft.net, classic.minecraft.net, you're going to play the Minecraft game and it's using BabylonJS to do the rendering, etc. We work with a lot of small, high, very large companies. And my favorite are probably the um, enthusiasts, like uh, students or people that just do that because they want to learn how to create a game or to create 3D. And that's why we created the engine. And so, also, I want to uh, underline and second what John said just before. We created the engine, but we also created a lot of tools. And I'm going to get back and demonstrate these tools. Just name dropping here, I'm going to get back to that later. The goal for me is to mention that it's not just an engine, it's actually the engine is a small portion of it. The tools that let you create what you want to create in 3D are really the important point here. Okay, so I have a quick video because I, I wanted to capture what the community was creating with BabylonJS. So instead of going through a, a demo manually, I created a quick video for you to see. Right. It was an example of, in real time, obviously, running on any computer, what can be done with the framework itself. So, instead of spending too much time just talking, I would like to uh, show you in action what you can do with BabylonJS. I'm going to start with a first presentation of one of the tools that I have. Nope, it's not here. The playground. The playground. So BabylonJS-Playground.com is a place where you can go to learn the engine. So uh, I spend a lot of time writing documentation, and that's a pity because no one's read it, right? You don't read documentation. No one's read them. Uh, so I decided to take uh, the problem the other way, like, how do I uh, learn? I learn by trying, right? And so that's why we created the Babylon Playground. Here, you have on the left a full-fledged editor, and on the right, you have the real-time rendering of what you just typed on the left. The editor comes with IntelliSense, so if you type here, you can get help while you type. So instead of reading documentation, again, you can just experiment, okay? And I'm going to just show you what can be done in a matter of a few seconds here. So here, I have a scene that I created. I create a camera which is the point of view that I can manipulate with touch or with my mouse. I set the target of my camera and I attach it to the events. By calling attach control, I attach to the mouse event, the pointer event and stuff like that. So I can play with my finger here or just with my mouse if I want to, or the, the keyboard. 
That's all coming from this line. Then I create a light, okay, like in real light, in, like in real world, you have a light. I set the intensity of that light and the sphere. So if I run that, I just have my sphere in the center of my screen, okay? As a user, now what you can do is to experiment, and we use the playground for experimentation, but also for bug fixing when a user comes to us and says, hey, I have a bug. Um, most of the time we ask them to reproduce the bug here because it's then easier to discuss. So I'm going to create actually a material. The material here will be a PBR, sorry, Babylon, dot PBR metallic roughness material. It's a specific kind of material that simulates metal. Okay, I'm going to give it a name. And as you can see, there is, uh, uh, while I type, help on the parameters. So for instance, I want the name here, like foo, and the scene where I want to have my material. Then I set my sphere.material to that material. Okay, And I'm going to just quickly set some values, like metallic, it will be fully metallic, between 0 and 1. And is, is that a little bit too small, maybe, right? Let me change the font size to something bigger. Okay, sorry about that. And I want also to set my material to be um, the roughness of it, like brushed metal, if you prefer, will be 0 0.5, again, between 0 and 1. If I run it, you have a sense of something change, like it's a bit a metallic, but the power of a metal, like in your car, is because you see the reflection of the environment, right? A car by itself with no reflection looks rough. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to just ask the scene to create a default environment for me. And by doing that, now, here, I have a sphere which is like brushed metal, okay? So I can play with the parameters, but I told you it's all about tools. So here I have the playground, but we also have a second tool that I would like to show you, which is the inspector. Here I can invoke the inspector by calling debuglayer.show. Show. And if I do that, zip, I'm going to have an additional UI that will be on top of my scene here, where I can see the tree view. So I have my glide, my camera, my sphere, and the background that was generated by the created environment. And I can take my material here, and I have all the properties of that material. And for instance, I can play with the levels here and change the opacity or the roughness. So fully metallic. Fully rough. Okay. Let me just get closer. So that's, that's the Chinese um, theater in um, Los Angeles. And you can play with the parameter here. Also, we introduce a lot of uh, options that you can change, like I want to render in wireframe and stuff like that. You can play with it here. Okay. That's the inspector. The inspector is extremely useful to debug or just develop your scene. So you can visually, instead of just typing the code in the playground or in your application, you can just visually debug the scene itself. Right. Another tool I, would like, I wanted to show you is the documentation itself. Yes, I know people won't go there, but still, I would like to show them the documentation for one reason. Here we have a regular documentation with code practice, example, the regular documentation you should um, uh, be looking for. But we also have the playground here. And the playground is actually a tool that's going to search through all the examples that were created in the playground here. Because in the playground, if I hit save, it will generate for me a unique URL that I can share with my friend with this code running. Okay? And that it's stored in our database. And if I want to learn something, I could just search for the documentation or I could just search for examples showing me how to do something, like I want to do shadows. And I can search for shadows inside our database. And here, you're going to see, like, I just lost my mouse. OK, thank you. I can find any example here where people just do something with shadows. And I can click on the playground button here. It's completely random. I have no idea what's inside this playground. Hopefully, it's not something stupid. OK, there is shadows. Cool. Someone was doing that with shadows, OK? And so I can lurk the code here and say, OK, what did you do with this uh, code? And maybe that's going to help me learn or understand how the shadows works. Right. Among new features that's going to be available soon, there is the node material editor. I created here 
a material, but this material is actually me setting some parameters to an existing material. We have a couple of materials. We have what we call the standard material, which is the fastest and the simpler one. And we have the pretty advanced physically based renderer, which is used here, the PBR. But if you want to do something different, uh, you have to uh, use what we call the shader material. The shader material is up to you to code using shader languages, your own material, OK? That's, that it's a friction point, definitely. A lot of people say, I, I would love to create my own material, but I don't want to learn um, uh, how to create uh, shaders. So we introduce, with the very new version here, the Node Material Editor. The Node Material Editor is a way for you to create your material. So who is aware of what a shader is? Quite a few, OK. A shader is made, actually, of a C-like language that's going to explain to the GPU how to create your own uh, rendering. OK, here. Here I have a pretty simple one, and I will just focus on the second part here. A shader is made of a vertex shader and a fragment shader. The vertex shader explains how the geometry is drawn on the, on the screen, and the fragment shader explains how to compute the color. And here my color is just, I want to set a color to the output. OK? This tool will let me actually create my own um, shader without having to develop them. For instance, here I'm going to open and look for the light. I want to add lightning support. Here, my object is just flat, it's just gray. Okay? To support lightning, I need to add light support here. And the light support here will expect me to provide a few parameters that you can see on the left here. I'm going to just quickly connect them. So the world position which is the position of my mesh in the world, and the world normal, which is the a normal is a perpendicular vector defining the surface of all, all, every object, OK? If I just clock them here and do that, then, boom, I have support for light. A shader was developed for me by the system. I can export the shader here. So instead of coding the shader, which is quite big if you look at it. All of that is required to do a lightning shader. You just have to wire some stuff, right? And that can go even better than that. I, instead of having just plain color, I want to have a texture. So think about your game. You have your character, and you want to have lightning. OK, done. And I want also to have a texture, OK? So let me just load a texture here. A texture will require me to give it a texture. Perfect like a crate. And what I want to do is actually take the light color, the texture color, merge them. And to merge them, I would remove this link here. Just multiply them. Boom. Taking the light output, multiplied by the texture output, plug that into oops, the output here. And boom, I have a crate with light. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Again, you can save your wonderful shader, and it will generate for you a unique URL here. And let me just fast forward to a complicated shader that I created for you. This one is pretty advanced. Uh, it's not that good looking, but it's just me as a developer trying to play the designer. So I have a shader, and you can see here, uh, there is what, I, what we call bump or normal. You, you feel like there is not a smooth surface. We feel like there is something um, defining the, a bump here, and actually just coming from a texture. And also at some places here, there, is, there are reflections. So it's a complex shader because the reflection is defined by a second texture here. That we are using a reflection texture to do the reflection here. We have a perturb normal object that will change the um, normal. And by the way, Doom 3, created by John Carmack, by the way, introduced this uh, notion of bump. Bump is using a texture to simulate the volume. Anyway, we don't care. Here, it's just that I want to um, use that code. So the shader here will generate for me code, like literal code that I can save here. I'm going to open the file, and this code is regular TypeScript code that you can use directly in your own environment. OK, so let me remove all of that. Tac. Dump here what was generated for me by the node generator. So the node generator, it's actually 
a uh, node model where you create a node material, and then you have blocks, transfer block, whatever block, texture block, etc. You connect all of them, like you connect the output with the input. So this code is just literally what I did visually. And then it gives you a node material object that you can plug with your sphere here. That material is equal to node material object. Let me close this guy here, close that, run that again, and boom. In my code, I have my wonderful reflection bump whatever scene. Yes, it's ugly, but it's about technical and development, right? It's not the designer track. All right, so all of that, uh, it's pretty cool. I can save it again, so I can save that, and it will generate for me a new version of my uh, unique URL here soon. It's a big one because uh, we dump the entire texture. So we just need to wait for the server to come back without an error, hopefully. Um, in the meantime, oh yeah, it's fine, it's done, okay. In the meantime here, let me show you a third tool. So BabylonJS is uh, developed to be easy to use. You do not have to understand shader, math, whatever. You just drop object, you create a light, a scene, a camera, an object, you load a GLTF file and you're done. But if you want to, um, there is no problem for you to just look under the hood and see how it works. And for that, we have a third object, which is uh, used by even our competitors. The name of this object is a, um, a browser extension. The name is Spector.js. Spector.js is a tool that will let me inspect WebGL, like a profiler for WebGL. So, at the first thought, you could think that it should be a tool developed by the browser vendor, but unfortunately, the browser vendor are not um, investing a lot into WebGL, so we did it. So here, when I click here, I have a record button, and the record button will just analyze the current frame and generate for me here a simple view of the orders that were sent directly to WebGL. So you can see here the direct, directly the bind vertex array, the viewport, all these commands are WebGL commands. And every time you can see, like, here I am clearing the screen, and here I am using this shader that I can edit live here to send the data. And so you can see precisely what, what's happening in your code. And you can even edit the code here, and it will dynamically change the rendering. All right? So this one is pretty advanced. Not a lot of people use it, but you should know that from the very beginning up to the end, like directly to WebGL, you have the control. All right. Then let me get back to my other demo. So that's new feature that we are adding with uh, the upcoming release for one. And this one is uh, one that I love. I am part of the W3C and Kronos working groups. And um, what I try to do with JavaScript is to make it uh, equivalent to what you can do with native. And one of the main problems of JavaScript is that it's running on one unique thread. There is a notion of web workers, but web workers are like process. To communicate between the main thread and the web worker, you have to send string or share just an uh, array of memory. We recently had a victory by uh, um, having the validation of the off-screen canvas. Here, and let me show you the code, it's going to be even easier to understand. If I look at my code, which is here, trying to make it bigger enough for you guys to see it. And can I zoom here? Yes. So I actually have here two scripts. Okay. If I find the off-screen canvas API in the Windows object, I will get a canvas, so there is two canvas, one on the left, one on the right, okay? The one on the left is just initialized by BabylonJS. So here you can see, I create the canvas, I create my engine, my scene, I say execute the code, render the scene, done. And so it just loads this object and rotates it, okay? It's done on the main UI, all right? The second one, it's exactly the same thing, but using not a canvas, but an off-screen canvas. And so when there is off-screen canvas support on your browser, so far only Chromium-based browser, meaning Edge, Opera, and Chrome, then you can call a new API called transfer control to off-screen, meaning that I will let a second thread control the canvas and render to it. And that's utterly cool. Why? Because now, here, it's a worker that runs this one. 
meaning that if I slow things down, when I'm going to click on this button, I will do something stu stupid like, uh, let me remember, yes, computing this random scene of cost 10 million times, just to simulate that you are doing something EV on the main thread. And we do that, for instance, when you are on SharePoint or on PowerPoint, let's say PowerPoint, when you display the current slide, PowerPoint is using the main thread to prepare the next slide. Okay? So the thread, the main thread, the main UI is already pretty easily occupied to do something. So by using off-screen canvas, we can have stuff that definitely are slowing down the main thread, but still, because a second thread is running and doing all your 3D rendering, the experience for the user is pretty good. Before, it was only that, and now we have access to the uh, worker render. Yes, I know. I'm excited, but for a good reason. Other stuff we are working on, I wanted to show you, like GLTF support. Here I have my Halion head, and if you look at my code, loading GLTF files, it's just one line of code here. Sorry, I forgot to zoom it again. And we have options to um, load it once and then duplicate it. If you are familiar with uh, Unity, I just can't remember now the name of that uh, feature, but you can load an object, an asset, and then introduce it multiple times in your scene. They are replicated uh, and not, it's a clone. So it's a smart clone. The geometry and all the shaders are, are reused. So here, the entire code to run these three guys with, uh, just for the sake of it, skeletal animation, meaning that the head is moving sorry, with, the, um, with the neck. And also there is a um, morph target. So the, the alien is smiling and closing the move. All of that is loaded from the GLTF and then duplicated. And it's what? It's 20 lines of code. Uh, this one, we don't care. Let's go next one. WebXR. So this demo, you know it. Yes. We are in Hill Valley, <laughs> about to go back in time. Uh, and it's running in the browser, yes, I know. That's very cool, I like that. And there is a little button here. I don't have a headset connected, so when I'm going to click on this button, Babylon.js will automatically consider that you want to use some uh, cardboard stuff, like running on your phone and setting that in a cardboard. It will switch to cardboard mode, just to give you the, um, the experience here. So if you have an Oculus Quest, a uh, Oculus VR, a Microsoft Mixed Reality headset, thanks to WebXR, we just click on this button and we will take care of everything for you. And it's literally one line of code. There is one line of code to switch. We have an object named the VR Experience Helper. You just need to instantiate it and it will automatically detect everything for you, provide the button, and the scene that was not VR before then become a, uh, a VR scene. Up to a point where you can... Ah. I need to reload, sadly. should be fine. We also support collision, I mentioned that. So here it's a uh, kind of a doom in a museum. And I walk like in a game, meaning that I can't go through the wall, okay? But I can go upstairs by just walking like in doom or quake. Exactly the same uh, the way I, I, I play it with my um, keyboard and my mouse. And that's running in your browser, obviously. And at some point you want to switch into VR. Boom. Just click the button. And then you can teleport uh, with the controller. Right. Last but not least, I wanted also to mention this guy. You saw the video. That's physics, real-time physics using WebAssembly. Uh, here you have a complicated mesh, this uh, marble tower, and we have a code here on the left that just drop marbles at the top of the tower, and then we let the physics engine deal with that. And to just drop a marble, let me show you where is that. When we call create marble here, let me zoom again. The only thing you have to do is to say, okay, my marble has a physics impostor. So there is an impostor representing in the physics engine my, uh, my, my marble here, and it's going to be a sphere with a mass of two and a friction of whatever. Okay? And just with that, you let the system drop, and it will control for you the entire emulation, up to a point where we have a complicated scene here with a, uh, this object, choop, choop, this scale. Also, when they reach this point, I should have a smaller window, right? Here, bloop, they go to, into the wheel, and that's also physics engine just applying uh, real-time constraint on it. Right. Let me get back to my slide.
So, you should try it. Everything is entirely free. There is no uh, hidden line or whatever. Or you have all the links here, babylonjs.com, doc.babylon, etc., the forum, the playground, enemy, the dot material editor if you want to play with shaders. That's it. Right on time. Super cool, right? Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. My pleasure. And uh, we have some questions. So, uh, okay, what's the advantage of <laughs> Babylon JS over 3JS? Um, what's the advantage? First, we are a team of 10 people paid by Microsoft to maintain it. We have a 24-hour bug turnaround. So you declare a bug, it's fixed in less than 24 hours. Uh, we do not have backward compatibility issues, like uh, I know 3JS for that. Uh, and we have tools. 3GS is a good tool. I, I don't want to say it's a bad tool. It's, we just have a different philosophy. Babylon GS is more aimed for uh, professional products in the sense that there is support um, and there is uh, this turnaround uh, for the bugs. Like we fix bugs very, very fast. Like definitely when I saw, saw John Romero mentioning that you should fix bugs first, that's exactly us. We stop everything we are working on to just fix bugs. We do not have bugs. And we have a link on our GitHub. If you go to the GitHub, there is a mention the average time to fix a bug on our uh, repo, and so far it's uh, less than 24 hours. I guess it's 20 hours. Okay. Uh, just from my side, I've used 3JS before, and um, it usually took me like quite a few hours to get started with any project. And with Babylon JS, I started using it, and maybe because I came from 3JS and the basics are almost the same, but I developed something like a VR, just a shooter, where you can shoot balls just into empty space or something within like one hour and had it running on my Oculus Quest in the browser, which was super cool. So I think like the, just the getting started is way easier, at least for me it was. That's why we have a documentation. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no one's uh, care about documentation. Uh, uh, what's in it? What's in for it for Microsoft? You mean why, what the reason of Microsoft to support the product, I guess? Yes. Um, I created BabylonJS on my um, uh, spare time. And Microsoft was interested to use it. Uh, so we use it in SharePoint, in Dynamics, in other products. We have 12 products in Microsoft using it. And I, uh, I was also working for Microsoft. It was not correlated at the beginning. Uh, and they asked me if um, I wanted to keep working on, on BabylonJS. And I asked them. I will provide you support for all the 12 products that you have, but as a compensation, you give me a team and we keep it open source and people can use it. So it was a win-win situation where Microsoft get a uh, fully uh, fledged team supporting the product, whereas I keep my, uh, I want it to be open and for everyone. So it was a win-win situation. Oh, I have a question. Um, so you told me earlier that you developed another game engine before you yes. came to Microsoft. Yes. Can you like <laughs> tell us about that a little bit? And actually, and I was uh, almost emotional when I saw so John Romero because uh, I was a big fan of him and John Carmack, and I created my own engine when I was uh, 17. It was a C uh, using an engine developed with C on DOS using Whatcom, and I imported it back to uh, DirectX, um, and then I joined Microsoft, and so I stopped, and I sold the company I created because it was a, a 3D engine for architecture, and I sold my company, I moved to Microsoft, and when I was at Microsoft, I was like, oh my gosh, I still want to do 3D, right? So I, I, at that time, at that specific time, six years ago, uh, we shipped IE 10, and IE 10 came with the very first version of WebGL for Microsoft. It was here for, since ages for Chrome, but Microsoft entered the 3D game on the browser like six years ago. And so I, I was like, okay, I want to do 3D stuff. There is this WebGL support now everywhere, thanks to IE. Okay, let's create a port of my old engine, which was uh, now Babylon JS. That's really cool. Like, with 17? <laughs> um, um, okay, I have another fun question at the end, but um, how do you pass data between other JS code and the 3D application? Are there any restrictions? So your 3D application will be JavaScript as well. So there is no restriction at all. Like literally, uh, BabylonJS is like jQuery or any other framework or React or whatever. You're going to use it the same way. Uh, we have ES6 version of it and ES5, and ES depending on if you want to use it with module or without module. Uh, and there is no restriction. Like literally, all the applications using BabylonJS just communicate through uh, JavaScript. 
Okay, there is uh, one on performance. What about performance and compatibility with mobile devices? Another good reason to use Babylon JS. One of our motto is to make sure that it works everywhere. So we have a full list of devices that we test on. And I would say that like 20% of Babylon JS core code is about compatibility. So we know that on specific version of iOS, of Safari, of IE, of Firefox, or whatever, we, we have um, hack <laughs> because WebGL is a spec. And human implementing a spec, you know it works, right? Uh, so everyone understands things a little bit differently. So we make sure that it works everywhere. And then we have thousands of uh, countermeasures for performance. So we support WebGL 2 by default. If you don't have WebGL 2, we have a fallback for WebGL 1. If you are supporting WebGL 1 with extension, we're going to use the extension for you. So it's transparent in the sense that we try to reach out the best performance. We know that in mobile, the CPU is the problem. So we try to move everything to the GPU. Even collision should be done by the GPU if you can. So we run on Chromebooks, for instance. Uh, Flipgrid, if you know it, is an application Microsoft acquired recently. They were just using JavaScript, but they were not able to run on Chromebooks because uh, uh, it's an application that do um, screen capture for students. The way they did uh, screen capture was very easy on the CPU, and by using uh, Babylon JS, they were able to move a bit of this code onto the GPU, and they were able to reach out a uh, user using Chromebooks. So that's very important focus for us. So you have full support already for web GPU? We are the only engine that I know of supporting WebGPU. Okay. Yeah, that's also what my last stand was. Um, okay, what are the next steps for Babylon JS features, etc.? Uh, no, no, number one is uh, we're gonna ship for one in uh, February. February will be about what I show you today, like uh, finishing the uh, node material editor is number one key feature. And number two is supporting WebGPU. WebGPU is not even a draft spec so far. It's an evolving version. So every week I have one of my engineers just changing all the code we had to adapt to the new spec. Like, oh yeah, they reverse the viewport, or it's now up or down, anyway. Uh, so that's going to also be uh, the, the main portion of uh, for one. And WebXR just hit the draft um, spec uh, standard recently, so we plan to make sure that everything works for, for one as well. And WebXR, which is an evolution of WebVR, is complicated because it's not just about VR, it's also about AR. So we are also working with the HoloLens team to make sure that uh, you can do AR with uh, the web. So it's WebXR on the AR context, uh, supporting fingers instead of controller, stuff like that. So that's the third big bucket of for one. And then you still need the 3,000 euros for the HoloLens. Uh, yes, but I'm not <laughs> responsible for that. <laughs> I would have given that to everyone else. Um, I like this one. Would you recommend Babylon JS for 2D or 2.5D development? Honestly, um, if you compare to Pixie or um, uh, other uh, framework, 2D framework, it depends on what you want to do. For 2 Dot five, yes, definitely, and we have a lot of people using it. Uh, we recently came across a uh, company creating games for uh, Las Vegas. Um, what's the name? Uh, you know the um, slot yes, slot machines exactly. It's uh, purely 2D, but they are using 3D to move the cards and stuff like that. So if there is a sense of at least layers, yes, Babylon JS is a good example. Else, you should stick with pure 2D uh, framework. Tools. Unless you're interested by no backward compatibility issue and uh, the turnaround of bug, then we also have a 2D version of Babylon JS, so it could be uh, useful. Okay, I have another question. Um, did you actually have to support at, um, Internet Explorer with Babylon JS when you're working to, for yes. Microsoft? Yes, uh, we still support it. What? If you take my demos, they run on, Babil on uh, Internet Explorer. The playground won't work because I am in love with the arrow function, you know, the new arrow function of JavaScript, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> but uh, I, I was like, okay, the playground will not work on IE, that's not a big deal, but every rendering stuff will work because, uh, yeah, it's important for us. Uh, One more. Okay. One more question, and um, just kind of look through here. I saw one that I can quickly support. Uh, which browser do we support all? Can you import models, maps, materials you, will, you build in other software if so, what formats are supported? So yes, um, part of the Babylon JS tools I did not share today, we have exporters for 3ds Max, Maya, uh, Unity, Blender 3D, and a few others. Um, and we also develop transcoders. And the goal is to have everything in GLTF file format. So as long as your tool that you are using is uh, exporting into GLTF, 
then we will be able to load it. And we are also uh, supporting tools that generate GLTF into the tools I mentioned before, like Maya, Autodesk, Autodesk Maya, 3ds Max, Blender, and stuff. Okay, let me see if I find one more. I th there's some over AI. I don't get the uh, AI. Um, um, how accessible is Babylon to designers? We have, um, we have users that are purely designers. They use another tool that I did not demonstrate here. It's the Sandbox. The Sandbox is a place where you drag and drop a GLTF model, and the inspector pops, and you can edit everything just visually. Uh, and they use that a lot to create. We have a viewer as well. It's a tool that you can plug in a page. In just one line of HTML, you say display this object, and there is no code, just a HTML uh, tag. Uh, so they use that uh, to display controls and 3D objects, for instance. Okay, last one. Is it possible to stream 3D geometry to between server and client for an open world level? Yes, we have users doing that. Super cool. We so just do the client rendering, to be honest. We don't do the, uh, the back end, for instance. And the streaming, you have to stream something compatible with Babylon Chess, but yes, we are doing that. Okay. If you have any other question, feel free, I'm going to stay here. Trying not to sleep, so it should be fine. If someone talk to me, it's going to be fine. First, you can have lunch now. There's okay. going to be lunch. Okay. So everyone, have a good lunch, and uh, yeah, thank you. Very see much. you after the break. <laughs>